All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us for a Boston Harbor Islands adventure. Author, author Stephanie Scurro is here to discuss her brand new book, A Boston Harbor Islands Adventure, The Great Brewster Journal of 1891. Uh, a little bit about um, Stephanie here. So, so this particular book uh, was written by volunteers with the Friends of the Boston Harbor Islands, which is a nonprofit environmental and educational organization that encourages public use of the islands, balanced with the need to protect their fragile ecosystem and historic environment. And this particular project, the coordinator was Stephanie Scurro. And Stephanie is a veteran journalist who has worked for the Boston Herald and the Associated Press. Her previous books, of which I think she's given presentations to this library on, uh, include Inside the Combat Zone, the stripped down story of Boston's most notorious neighborhood, uh, Drinking Boston, a history of the city and its spirits, uh, Boston on Fire, a history of fires and firefighting in Boston, as well as the Coconut Grove Fire. And again, wanna thank the Corning Foundation, the Friends of the Library, and the other uh, seven uh, libraries who helped promote tonight's talk. So all 100 plus who are watching live, and uh, everyone else who will watch the recording. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Stephanie for joining us tonight. And Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me and see me and, and Robert will, will uh, take care of things if you don't. I am so happy to be here. I wanna thank Robert and the Tuxbury Library for inviting me. I, I just love speaking to people um, in, in libraries, even if it is virtual, I do enjoy that. And I'm very excited to be here today to talk about this new book. And if you've attended to some of my other events, uh, I might explain why I'm so excited because in this book, nobody dies. No one dies a gruesome, horrible death in a fire or there's no crime, there's no, no mayhem. This is a wonderful story about a very interesting group of women who in 1891, went out to one of the far islands in Boston Harbor, Great Brewster, uh, uh, Great Brewster Island, kept a journal, a record of what they did, which has come to us in a very mysterious fashion. And now after 132 years, they are still speaking to us. Um, as, as, as Robert said, this book uh, was supported by the Friends of the Boston Harbor Island and all the proceeds from the book sales go to support the Friends of the Boston Harbor Islands uh, in their work on protecting and advocating for the Boston Harbor Islands. Now, if we were together, I would say, how many of you have been to the Harbor Islands? And a lot of you will raise your hands. And so today we're going to take a trip out there for those who've been there and to those who have yet to go. So what I would like to do today is to share the highlights from this journal, from this book, this from our book, but also from the journal itself, and how we, and I'm using the royal we here, solve the mysteries of the four women who spent more than two weeks in a ramshackle house on Great Brewster Island from July 15th to July 31st. We're really kind of in the anniversary period. Um, for those uh, unfamiliar with the islands, here's a map, and you can see that the... Um, uh, Brewster Islands are all called the Brewsters are at the far end of the harbor. I don't know if you can see my cursor here and you can see them here. Um, Great Brewster Island is right there and uh, they are far out in the harbor and yet from there you can see back into the city very well and we're going to talk about that. Now here is a map of the harbor islands about the time that the women visited out there's from the 1890s and you can see from that map all these lines around the islands here um, and the shore and that's because it's very shallow there so there's a real variation in the tide level in all these islands and that kind of plays a role in what we're going to talk about one thing about these islands is that they are what they call drumlets in other words these are hills that were cre created by receding glaciers when this whole area was covered by glaciers so glaciers moved out they created these uh, uh, rounded hills or, or um, mountains and then the sea moved in and basically made them islands, not hills. It's called, this area is called a drowned drumlin field. And there's very few of them in the world, but we have one in Boston Harbor. Now, where did this journal that I keep referencing come from? 
Well, it came to us by chance and only by coincidence. And uh, it, it was the result of this very distinguished gentleman, because he's at Harvard, and of course they make him very distinguished there, who um, had found it. And what happened is he was taking a bike ride in Cape May, at Cape Ann, excuse me, and he had a flat tire in his bike. He stopped right in front of a used bookstore. So he stopped into the bookstore just to take a break. And he found this journal or album or scrapbook. It's kind of hard to figure out what it is sitting on the counter. And he said, this is great significant, great historical significance. We need to preserve this. Don't take it apart to sell it. Here's my credit card. Harvard will buy this. And I'll put my credit card down as um, a guarantee of that. And indeed, it was um, obtained by Harvard. Actually, it went to the Schlesinger Library at the Radcliffe Institute, which is now part of Hive Harvard. And this is how the journal looked um, when he first saw it. And now it is it preserved. It's in a much better state of preservation at the Schlesinger Library. And we are very grateful to Schlesinger Library for giving us permission to use uh, this journal as part of our work. So what's in it? Oh, uh, well, here's some pictures from it. You see there there's illustrations and there's photographs. And you can see that the journal itself was called Ye Log of Ye Square Party at Ye Great Brewster in Ye Pleasant Month of July, 1891. And you and right off you off the bat, you see, well, that's kind of interesting. They're calling it a log. They're using all this weird archaic language. And I found out about this uh, this diary or, or journal in 2008. And a few years later, Susan Gall Marsh, uh, who was with the Friends of Boston Harbor Island, she heard about it and she went to look at it. And both of us are intrigued. In fact, I wrote an article about it for the Harvard Gazette in 2009. Now, why was this journal so intriguing? Well, for one thing, there were these daily entries of going back to 1891. There were illustrations, there were watercolors, there were photographs, and there were uh, the women took sort of a documentary approach to their trip. They had a diagram of the cottage they were staying at. They had portraits of the landscape, portraits of each other, and they quoted from the poetry of the day. In fact, I like to compare it to the Facebook of 1891 because it had that that kind of feeling of here's what we did here's what we ate here's some pictures everyone's happy that kind of thing that you find on facebook but the the journal was intriguing because of what was not in the journal for example there was no context again like Facebook, this is what happened today, but there's no context of how that relates to the rest of the people's lives. There was no context, who owned, who owned this cottage? She never explained it. What did they do next? Where, why did they even go there? But the most intriguing thing about it was there were no names in the journal. The women did not refer to each other by their names. The, the journal was not necessarily signed. They only referred to themselves by four intriguing nicknames that they adopted. The autocrat, the aristocrat, the acrobat, and the scribe. And this is how they depicted themselves. And they called themselves Ye Square Party of Ye Merry Trippers. So right off the bat, there was a mystery. Who were these women and why did they, why did they even keep this journal? Now, um, the thing that you have to know about this journal is, again, it's like a documentary. It records everything that they did that day. So it is a virtual a telescope back into their trip and by extension into 19th century women's lives. Here are some sample pages from this journal. And you can see the photographs are mixed in with descriptions, with little illustrations, and some of the, some of the uh, pages are all photos and some of them are all illustrations. Here's the cottage that they stay in. They took a very beautiful picture of this cottage, which is on Great Brewster Island, which is uh, again, at the far reaches of the harbor. They drew up a floor, floor plan and they took pictures of every room in the house, kind of to document. Now, to give you a kind of an idea of what, what's in the journal, I want to read you the entry from July 19th, 1891, 132 years ago today. So here's an entry. Again, a sunny morning greeted us after a rainy night 
but clouds gathered early in the day and gave us some beautiful effects as they shifted from one quarter of the heavens to another. Now shroding the gilded dome, by the way, that's a state house which they could see from there, in falling rain, now deluging, deluging Hull and Strawberry Hill. Soon after breakfast, a small sloop came to our mooring. And Mr. Wardrip, Mr. Cheney, and Mr. McFarland from Boston came up shore, bringing us the Sunday Globe and letters to the autocrat and the acrobat. After dinner, instead of our usual walk, we sat on the piazza, which is this deck that you see there, and enjoyed the beautiful sunset, which filled the sky and water with glory. And when the moon, almost at the full, appeared behind the clouds, we felt that nature had shown us many of her varying moods of this day. We sat in the moonlight until late, discoursing, as old friends will, then betook ourselves to the dining room to read out loud a sermon on faithfulness and a half hour of Kenilworth finished our day. Now, a couple things about that. First of all, they read out loud to each other. Kenilworth is the novel by Sir Walter Scott. Uh, he also wrote Ivanhoe, so it was a very popular novel of the day. In fact, one of the researchers recently said them reading out loud to each other was kind of like their streaming service. They were taking little bits of it, so they're watching it as it went along. And a lot of those novels were writ written to be installments in, in magazines, so it, that kind of fits. You'll notice that they could see the Gilded Dome, which is the state house. And you can see that they may be on a remote island, but they're getting the Sunday paper delivered and they're getting letters. In fact, this diary is filled with them writing letters and receiving letters, which people were sending forth um, back and forth on the on the uh, boats that plied this harbor. Because the thing of, we have to remember is at this time, there was a lot of boat traffic in the harbor. It isn't like it is now with just pleasure craft and steamers and cruise ships. This was a lot of transportation by a lot of people in a lot of different ways, from fishermen to people just going in and out of the harbor because there were no cars, there were no airplanes. So they were able to take advantage of it. But it's interesting how the women seem to write a lot of letters receive letters and send letters. It was like they were texting, even though, of course, this was 19th century version of texting. One thing we found interesting that every single meal was recorded right down to the to the tea and the coffee. For example, breakfast this day was oatmeal, bacon, fried potatoes, corn cakes, tea, coffee. Lunch was crackers, sardines, cheese, and marmalade. Dinner was fried pork and eggs, baked potatoes, and rice pudding. And this, this is also intriguing. Why did they record every single meal that they ate? Um, here's another, here's a, one of the few close-ups of them on the porch. We can kind of get a sense of who they were. Remember, we don't have their names. We do know that they referenced uh, using the well on the island as a refrigerator because until they got ice, uh, for an ice box, they had to keep their food cold. They brought a lot of food with them, but they also had food deliveries. But to keep it cold, they would actually put it down in the well, where it was a lot cooler. And that's where they got their water as well. Um, an interesting thing about this journal, and th another reason why this is so significant, is a lot of the things that they're recording, like the house and the well, have completely disappeared. There's no trace of it. No, There are other houses on Great Brewster later on, Nothing remains. It's in a, back in a state of wildness. Now, I'd like to read you one little excerpt. This is my favorite excerpt from July 21st, 1891. And um, it's, it's a tale of woe. After dinner, the aristocrat and autocrat, with much preparation of rubbers, old skirts, pails, and spoons, went forth to drink clams for food tomorrow. The scribe and the acrobat were left to wash dishes, then to meet the other party at the northern end of the aisle to assist in bringing home the clams. With regret, they left a ruddy sunset and soon found their friends with light pails, cut hands, and long faces, but no clams. This is an interesting picture because this is taken on a land bridge or a spit of land that forms from Great Brewster at low tide. That's Great Brewster in the background and you can kind of, you can get a sense of the drumlins, the, the rounded thing, the rounded forms of these, these hills. But this area appears at a low tide and you can walk almost all the way out to George's Island. And the women took many trips out here, both to for the scenery and to take photographs. And this may be their house right there. It's a little hard to tell, or that may be it right. It might, that might be it right there. Again, hard to tell. But what's interesting about this is that 
still occurs today. And I've walked on that spit a few times that uh, emerges at uh, at uh, low tide. And a lot of people do, and it's great. Just have to keep track of the time so you don't um, get caught out there and you find yourself swimming back. Uh, the women were very talented. They, they made numerous references to the books they are reading. They sketched, they talked about sketching and making watercolors. And here's one of their watercolors, which is on, which is a Boston light, uh, the lighthouse on nearby Brewster Island. And um, this is a picture of a little Brewster today. And let me read you one more excerpt from July 24th, 1891, because they were constantly commenting on what they were seeing about them. For example, they could see to uh, George's Island and right to the, the harbor. And they said, it is always an interesting moment for at the appointed time, the light flashes from the lighthouse. That's this lighthouse here. The flag falls from Fort Warren and the sunset guns boom. They, they still boom, by the way. Music from the excursion boats in the harbor was wafted to us, and we could see the lighted trains of cars, and these are trains, not automobiles, crawling to and from Pemberton around Point, Point Allerton, and when the friendly lights gleamed all along the horizon from Crescent Beach to Minutes Light, we could not feel that we were far from the hub of the universe. The hub of the universe, of course, refers to the famous poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes calling um, the state house the hub of the solar system. But we like to think of it as the universe, not just the solar system. Um, many of the things they took pictures of are no longer with us. For example, this is a structure called bug light. It was so called because the structure looks like kind of a bug on a, a spindly legs. Um, and that burned down some years later. Um, it was a very popular subject for postcards, but today there's, there's nothing left to it. You can see, um, George's Island in the background. Here are three of the women. Here's a boat coming by. And of course, there's the lighthouse. <laughs> they also made a very good picture. And I, we had a photo historian analyze this picture. And she says, it's one of the best pictures in the journal. And it's a portrait of the cow that apparently lived on the island, who they dubbed the Lady Brewster. And as the historian pointed out, it's an excellent portrait you're getting, you're making on, eye contact with it, have the gleam off her, off her hide. But apparently at that time, there was a cow living out there. How, how she got there and how she left, we have no idea. So you can see there's a richness of materials in this diary. So in, uh, I've been interested in this in years, I've been researching it, we, we're, there's so many mysteries, but the Friends of the Boston Harbor Islands decided they would fund a project in which they reproduce or print the journal using my help as the coordinator and volunteers. We may be able to negotiate a contract with uh, History Press, uh, but we decided to not just write about, not just print it, but we put it in context. We'd explain what's going on in, the, in 19th century women's lives at the time, in the Harbor Islands and in the city of Boston. We assembled our team here and here we are later. Uh, we met, this was during COVID, so we met by Zoom. And of course, I picked out the most unflattering portrait I could find of a Zoom, but this is how we met. And our first step was to actually transcribe the journal, which we did in a, using Google Docs. And we put notes on the side as, as we were recording it. We said, here's some things that we're learning about it. We created um, a forum in, again, in Google Docs where we put all our material, we are all gathering materials, we put it all together so we could all keep track of it. And we set out to research the many little items that were mentioned here. For example, um, they mentioned a game named Halma, which is actually a board game, and they we found out about that. They The food we mostly knew, but there's something called Rochester Jelly Cake, and we're very curious about that. And one of our volunteers, tears, Mal, uh, Marguerite Krupp, uh, researched it, found recipes from that time period on the web uh, and found out what it was and included it. We have a recipe for it in our book, so you can make it yourself. Now, to our eyes, the women looked very dressy. I mean, here's a picture of their long skirts. They have hats. They're all kind of decked out, but they kept referring to themselves as being in their island garb. They're dressed down. They're kind of in their casuals, and we realized that women of this era were, if, if there were a certain uh, class, were dressed up very much. And so what we did was we researched what were the fashions of the day 
included some images of that. But this picture here of this of this woman looking at Fort Warren in the background, for her, that was the equivalent of shorts and a t-shirt today. That's how they considered it. The other thing we did was this, the journal is filled with quotations from all kinds of, of 19th century poets like um, John Greenleaf Whittier, Lucy Larcom, who was interesting because she was a mill girl from Lowell, who she'd worked in the mills, but she became a poet and very popular. They quoted her, they quoted Lord Byron extensively and Elizabeth Barrett, Barrett Browning. And it was interesting because they're often throwing quotes without identifying who it was. It's because well, everyone knows who these people are. So it was kind of, again, the, the popular culture of their day. But we, we, oops, we managed to find those uh, quotations through Google and put them in context. Um, and we found that to be a challenge for us, but also very interesting because we found out one other thing. They quote these poets and writers, but often they'd have one or two words missing or, or, or misquoted. There was some misquotion quoting. So they weren't copying it from somewhere. They were they were doing it from memory, we think. I'm not sure, but we think it's from memory. So there were some parts that weren't quite complete. Now, um, our, we are very lucky to have in our group of volunteers, Liz Corella, who is a professional photo historian. And she took a deep dive into looking at the photos, which were all throughout this journal. And she was able to conclude that two kind of cameras were used. Uh, the round images, there were a lot of round images, were taken by something that was one of the earliest Kodak box cameras. Now, before this, uh, photographers had to bring a lot of equipment. They you had to use plates that were doused in all kinds of noxious chemicals. But Kodak came up with a box camera that people could carry and essentially take some of the first snapshots. So they would you would get a box with a hundred exposures on it. You take your pictures. You, there was no viewpoint. You just had to hold it up and pray. And then you send the whole box to Kodak, who would develop the pictures and send you back a reloaded box. There are also square pictures or re rectangular pictures. And uh, Liz believes that these were probably done by another early Kodak camera, the number three uh, or the model A. Oops, sorry. Let me back up here. And um, th there was some advantage that they could be loaded in subdued light. So this was an advantage for people who were just taking some of the first snapshots. And interesting, when we researched this, Liz did a great job researching this. We found out that many of these early cameras were marketed to women. In fact, their slogan was Kodaker, they call them Kodakers. You press the button, and we do the rest. And if you see, this is an illustration of advertised, sorry, an advertisement for a Kodak and the women, and it's being directed at women and women are saying, oh, isn't this lovely? I must have a Kodak. And so um, again, these women were using some of this technology which actually was being directed toward women. But here's the thing, we still had to identify the women and we had very good pictures of them. We had their nicknames and a little bit about them, but we didn't know who they were with one exception. We did know the identity of one of the women. And that's only because when the journal was found, there was a note stuck into it from a Charles Nichols who indicated that it was an account of a, of a visit to Great Brewster Island in Boston Harbor. And the women were friends of his mother's uh, and the scribe, Miss, Miss Helen Whittier. So he knew one of the women was someone named Helen Augusta Whittier. And she was a member of a 15 club because we found this, this reference to um, the, the logo of the club, which is uh, 15 in Roman numerals. And we were able to find out quite a bit about Helen Augusta Whittier. And, and we were able to confirm that she did go to Brewster Island and she was a member of the 15 club. And, and uh, this is a memorial. I mean, she was well known among a certain number, a certain group of, of women throughout the, the Boston area. Now she was from Lowell. So we knew that she was from Lowell and so that was uh, began our search because you figured the other women were also from Lowell because the 15 club 15 club was also based in Lowell. Um, one thing about Helen Whittier again found out a lot of lot of information about her, but we found out this interesting fact: she was one of the first women to run a mill in Lowell, uh, the Whittier Mill in Lowell, 
And I don't know if you know about Lowell history, um, but he has a long history of being uh, a center for uh, cotton mills and fabric mills. It was called Spindle City. And Helen's father and older brother died in right after each other. So she actually took over the mill and ran it um, uh, for a certain period of time. And so there's a lot of reference to her to being a female entrepreneur, but it's very interesting that she ran this, which, which gave us a clue that um, of who she was and also the social class of the women. These were not poor women. They were like more middle class and they were not young women. They were in their forties when they went out to the, to the island. By the way, this is a picture of the Whittier Mill today, which has now been turned into housing. This picture of it in Lowell. So we were started, uh, we were able to trace a lot of things through this article that appeared in the uh, Boston Globe. It actually appeared in the Lowell paper and then again in the Globe. And it talks about the, the um, 15 Club. It mentions Miss Whittier, mentions many other members of the club. It mentions the trip to Great Brewster Island. In fact, it talks about a time when nine women went out there and we soon learned that there were more than one trip to Great Brewster Island and there was more than one diary or, or journal. And so that was very interesting. So we, we developed this list of the 15 members of the 15 club because we figured they have to fit in to this diary somewhere. And so we were trying to match up names and initials and that kind of thing. And for example, we were looking around for the initials BC because BC was on a number of these particular illustrations. There's BC, H-A-W, this is Helen Augusta Whittier, that's very clear, but who is BC, who is BC? And with the help of Martha Mayo, who is a historian in Lowell, we were able to figure that out. And I have to give a shout out to Martha because when we contacted her, um, she wasn't part of the initial group. We contacted her and she became part of our group because she was also a researcher or had researched Helen Whittier because she is from Lowell and she's a historian of Lowell. And she actually was very intrigued. She knew about the diary of the journal and she was actually looking into who these other women were. And so we all compared notes and Martha did a great job in, in zeroing, zeroing in and who we think they are. And she built a family tree and all kinds of things like that. And what we discovered that uh, the BC was likely Bella Coburn, Isabella Bella Coburn. Um, you'll notice that she died in 1895. So she just survived a few years after this trip um, and she never married, but she was the artistic acrobat. So the pieces started to fall together. We found um, the autocrat mentioned an autocrat in the, in the journal and mentioned an autocrat having a birthday. Well, uh, that day, and there's a birthday party for her, and, and we match that birthday to this woman, Helen Fra Francis Ray French, and so we were able to maybe determine that this is the autocrat. She's also a member of the 15 Club, and then Lizzie Dean Adams um, seems like another member of the club, and she, I'm my my image is frozen, but I'm hoping people can still hear me. Okay, we'll just keep. Going. We can, Stephanie, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, and we'll just keep going then. Okay, so the uh, the aristocrat was probably Sarah Elizabeth Lizzie Dean Adams, and she was from, her uncle was a gentleman named Benjamin Dean. Benjamin Dean was a very prominent lawyer and politician in the Boston area. He, his family's originally from Lowell, but he was, he was in Boston at this time. He also owned the house on Great Brewster Island. So he, or he leased it. He was, he, the, the ownership of a lot of those islands were a little bit dubious, but it, he was a member of the yacht club. And it's very, it's probably, that's probably the reason they went out to the island because they had a connection there with Benjamin Dean, the uncle of Lizzie Dean. And again, the Helen Augusta Whittier, vora, voracious. Um, indeed, we found a lot of reference to, to how much she lectured, she took photographs, she was an artist, she was an, a really amazing woman, but not much is really known about her because they didn't have, women weren't, uh, didn't get as much attention those days. So we are able to identify the women and the last step, and this was a project led by Alison Andrews, who did a great job in identifying that writers by handwriting. In other words, we thought, thought there were two, just two writers at first, because there's one very distinct writing. Um, and then there was 
another kind of writing, but realize there are actually four kinds of handwriting in there. They're all slightly different. And by using clues, like um, in the, the, the material that you see at, on this end, this very difficult to read um, handwriting, the, she's, this person, this writer is the only one that uses the I pronoun. The others all use we. Um, and so we are, if, if they're I, and she mentions other people, then we could, by the, the process of, of, of deduction, we could figure out who they are. So we basically found out who the women, who we, we tried to match. We pretty much were able to match up the handwriting. And we determined that they went in sequence. There was like, each took a turn writing a part uh, of that. So we were able to determine that. One of the mysteries though remaining is that, when did they write this journal? Because they couldn't put those photos in the journal at the time because you had to take them back. You had to send the photos to Kodak, they had to be developed. But the writing went around the pictures. So was this written and on the island and they thought they would get pictures there or was it recreated afterwards? And we feel that it was probably recreated afterwards as a kind of public document, again, like a Facebook page, that this journal was created to be something to be shared among the women, shared among other members of the 15 clubs. So it was basically a, a record and uh, recording of their trips, kind of the kind of thing that you would share with friends. So we gathered all this material and the result was this book, Boston Harbor Islands Adventure, and I'm just gonna show you the table of context because again, what we tried to do is put everything in context. We had we have not just the um, entries in the diary because frankly, the entries, it's not a mundane. Here's what we ate, here's what we did, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we are able to put it into the context of 19th century women's lives. We had history of Lowell, we have history of the islands. And so we really wanna give people a full treatment of what the significance of this journal is. And because we want other people, other researchers to jump into this and do more research. Our book is not the end all be all. We feel like there's more to research. For example, there's mention of another journal kept a few years earlier. There's another journal of a trip to the boss, to the um, Brewster Island around somewhere. Somebody has it or else it's been destroyed. But it may come forward. So what we're trying to do is create a document for scholarship, as well as just a really good read about this trip. And we went to celebrate, for example, and Spectacle Island after we all got it done, we got it to the printer, and we're all very happy about it. And Marguerite Krupp made a home baked Rochester jelly cake, and she brought it along, and we all got to have it. And it was really fun to eat that and sort of have this feeling of going back into time. So I need to tell you the book is available at your local um, bookstores. You can also order it off of Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all that. Um, but go to your local bookstore and have them order it. We always like to encourage that. If you want to visit the Boston Harbor Islands, and we encourage you to do that, you can go uh, to this website I'm showing on the screen. You can find out about the ferries to Pedix, to Spectacle Island, to George's Island. Unfortunately, you can't get out to Brewster unless you can only go there by private boat. And I would also encourage you to look up the Friends of the Boston Harbor Islands, look at the website, consider joining. It's a, it's a great group and does a lot of work in promoting the islands. Um, and I, I'm, I think that uh, these are some resources for you. And I'm just gonna do one final reading from the book. This is from the last entry of July 31st, 1891. At 10.30 a.m., we said farewell to our enchanted isle, so difficult to reach and so hard to leave. Turning our faces to the workaday world, we leave behind us the uneventful idyllic days like no others in our lives with their placid serenity, their pleasant spice of labor, the unruffled happiness of a custom comradeship and all the glory of sea and sky now only a winter fireside dream of dawns and sunsets by the summer sea. So thank you very much. And I would love to answer any questions if you have them. So I'm gonna kick it to Robert and see if he can read some questions from the chat. Thank you so much. So folks, let's give Stephanie a big virtual round of applause for a great presentation.
Stephanie, do me a favor. Let's stop mm -hmm. sharing your screen. And okay. Let's see if we can unfreeze your video. Let's see. Okay. Oh, maybe not. I'm going to stop your video, Stephanie, and I'm going to ask you to turn it back on. See if anything. Okay. Happens. No problem. Um, tr try it again because it says unable to start your video because the host has stopped it. Uh, I can try it again. Try it again now. Okay. Stop my video. Hey, hey, there hey. she is. All right. Uh, so, Sorry about that. Uh, I just folks, saw my face freeze and I was like, I hope they can still hear me. <laughs> so. Yeah, your face froze, but uh, your slides advanced. So, and we could hear you. So That's was, all we need. Better than right. my face. <laughs> there we go. So folks, if you have any questions, please get them into the Q&A. If you have any comments, please get them into the chat. Frank says, bravo. Rosamen says, fascinating program. I lived in Lowell for many years. I appreciate this history. Nancy says, thank you for a very enjoyable and informative lecture. Teresa says, wow, wow, wow. Stephanie, thank you for such a mysterious and intriguing presentation. I can't wait to order the book. Uh, Pat gives you a round of applause. Gail says, thank you. Bonnie says, great story. Kate says, excellent program. Uh, Angelina says, simply beautiful. Judith hey, notes that she you. was a uh, Judith was a long time friends of Boston Harbor Island volunteer. Right. It's a, it's a spec it's it's a spectacular island and it's one of her favorites. Great. Um, Judy says thanks for a great presentation. Bobby says my father used to take us to George's Island back in the fifties. Uh, mm -hmm. We came from Beachmont. Oh, great. Uh, great. Uh, Suzanne says this was very interesting. Lori says thanks so much. Kathy says, so interesting. Your enthusiasm was a plus. All right, I'm going to jump over to the Q&A, which is now yeah. populated with a bunch of questions. I was kind of giving it time, Stephanie, yeah. but here we right. go. Right. Uh, so uh, Joyce says, this was an amazing presentation. Would you say four female friends could try the same getaway today and achieve the same result, uh, i.e. the journal? Absolutely. I, I think what this shows, um, I mean, I mean, one of the things that we don't think about, but back in that time, a lot of the women in the 15 Club uh, were all very, very edu were educated women. They traveled together. So women used to travel together and it didn't, it, you know, they could be married, but they, they would travel with their female companions. And yeah, I think that people do this. I mean, un unfortunately today we sort of do it individually, like on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. But de generally speaking, I think people um, would, I think women would, could do the same thing. And certainly the things that they did were very similar to what a, a, fem a getaway among a, a bunch of women friends would would uh, would do today. For example, food. Food is very important on any kind of retreat. And a, a lot of times we take, like in some of the retreats I've been on, we take turns making meals, you enjoy meals, you, you eat what you want to eat, not what the family wants, you want what you want. Um, and uh, also the thing about playing games, they play games together, they... In, instead of sort of sitting in front of the television, they read out loud to each other. But it was a communal, this was a communal event in which they related to each other. And I think um, today that could happen just as well. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, was that a dog in the drawing of the four yes. women? Yes, it was a dog. Very good. Eye. Yeah, we don't know where that came from. We don't, we, the dog remains the mystery. So um, there is, yeah, there's a little dog that dances in the, um, in this a picture of the Mary Trippers uh, dancing. By the way, um, our team of researchers, and we had, a, I, I just can't say enough about the, the, the women, women and one man, I have to say, it was about eight or nine women and one man and we all did our parts and we pulled together and we called ourselves the merry trippers because that's what the women call themselves so so our emails were all hey merry trippers you know another meeting about the journal um but the the dog remains something that we we don't know we don't know why it's there but it sort of adds to the elan and the joyousness of the of the of the of that particular illustration uh, another anonymous attendee asks, do we know where the other journals are? No, we do not. We do not. There, I'm hoping that maybe if this book gets around, it would surface. I know that, for example, um, Martha Mayo, 
um, again, can't say enough good things about her. She is a she knows everything about Lowell. She's very and she's a promoter of Lowell, and she really um, she really knows that city inside out. And if there had been something in any kind of archive, she would have found it. And we did we did find another journal, but we don't think it's this journal. Uh, one of one of Helen's friends, Ellen, uh, somebody Woods has left some money in, in Cleveland in Ohio that's similar to this. And we haven't had a chance to really go look at it because it's in Cleveland and we've been trying to get to, we may, I may try to figure out a way to get out there and take a look at it. Um, so there may be others in other places, but we have been unable to um, find it yet. Uh, Karen asks, can we see the original in the Radcliffe Library? It is there. I think you have to make permission and make an appointment to see it. Uh, it's in a pretty fragile state. So it is, it's, it's not like something you can walk in and just look at. Um, the, there is a website for it and they do have some of it, uh, some of the pictures uploaded on online. Um, and in terms of seeing it, the, the, the pages are now encased in plastic. Um, so it is available to scholars, but I don't know what the rules are for using the material, but it's something that is um, being protected there. I mean, I will say in our book, um, not that to push our book, but we reproduce almost every single page in the diary. We didn't get every single one because some of them were a little marginal, but we have both the original pages and the transcriptions. So, and we have cult, we have a few color pages. So you can really get a sense of the diary. And that was deliberate too, because we wanted to create a document that you wouldn't have to necessarily go to the original to do additional research. You could you could work with a PDF, you could work with the book or you work with a PDF of it um, because it is a, it is kind of fragile. And the other thing is that cursive writing, um, it, reading cursive writing is a gradually a lost art. So um, as I said on a radio interview, we're all old gals, we can read cursive. Um, and but a lot of young scholars today don't have that experience. So having it transcribed will, will help with the with the um, with further, further scholarship. Uh, uh, Yulia asks, could you talk more about how you pitched the idea to Harvard and got their permission to use the journal? Well, we I had. We had been in touch with them um, about this. And from the very beginning of the process, we told them we'd like to do this. Would there be any problem with it? And they said, no. We said, actually, these images being really old are kind of out of, co are, they're not protected by copyright and they maintain a library. The whole point is to do scholarship. So we got their permission and, um, I mean, we wouldn't just do it without their permission. We got their permission. We actually got some more materials from them. And um, we, we interviewed John Stilgo again several times about this. So we kind of worked with the, with the Harvard folks to do this. Again, this is really old material, 132 years old. So it's really, um, it's, it's really outside the area where copyright really could kick in. Um, but we did work with them and they know all about the project and they seem to be very happy with it. So um, that, they want to see scholarship on these areas. And again, we would like this book to be a, a starting point for some of their scholars, someone at Harvard to say, hey, let me take another look at this, th this journal and let's, die let's find more about the other four women. Uh, let's find the other diaries or journals and find out a little bit more. So there you go. Uh, Britta asks, did the women have any children? Did they have any spouses? Yes, two of the women were married and did have children. Um, and they went out, like I said, they were, when one of them who went on this trip, she had kids who were teenagers, the rest were kind of older who went on this. Two of the women never married. Uh, Bella died soon after that, she never married. And Helen Augusta Whittier never married. And we had a lot of discussions among our group on why that was. There was some feeling, well, there weren't a lot of men after the Civil War, so she didn't have much to choose from. Uh, but I tend to think she was more like Louise Mel Alcott, that she chose not to be married because she wanted to live her life. There was also some implication that she was very good friends with another woman, whether it was a, it might have been a quote unquote Boston marriage, but we have no idea of this, the sexuality of it. There are absolutely no clues on that. Um, 
but I think there were at this time there were a lot of women who chose to not get married and because they wanted the freedom that that would accord although there were two of the women who were married who went on this trip they were all very close they knew the, they knew each other since high school so these were very old friends but you know Louise Malacan is a good example she was roughly contemporary maybe a little earlier but she chose not to marry as well uh, Carolyn asks, in that era, most women didn't work. Is that correct? Do you know anything about uh, the women's backgrounds? Well, women in this class may not have worked. But again, we talked about the mill girls. So there are many women who did work in, and worked in factories like there. And there are many women who worked as servants or housekeepers or there, there were teachers. So there were women working. Women of this class, though, wouldn't work the way we think of working today. Helen was an exception in the sense she helped to run the mill. So she was actually working. Um, the other thing I have to say about the women's club um, on this area is that um, the women's clubs weren't like we think of today. They didn't sit around and crochet or talk about gossip. These were clubs that were organized around lectures, around um, education, around presentations. The members would read books and discuss them together. It was the equivalent of either a correspondence course or kind of graduate level education. Then the women's club movement was huge, big. And Radcliffe has a lot of, and Slicer Your Library has a lot of material about that movement, which is a whole nother area of scholarship. So the women were able to use that to pursue uh, a kind of an education. But they didn't go to college. They did go to seminary, like like Helen and uh, Bella went to La, what is LaSalle, LaSalle University, was then LaSalle Seminary School. So it was for women. Um, but they, 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 there's some indications that they did help out, but they didn't hold jobs the way we think of today. And there's also a lot of discussion of how wealthy these women were. They were not poor women. It's very clear, they're not poor women. Were they wealthy? Could they be considered of the wealthy class or were they kind of upper class? There was a lot of discussion back and forth of, of where they fit into that. Um, and we can't say for certain. Um, certainly they lived in Lowell. They did not, Helen moved to Boston later on in life, but at this point she, but she was really, all of them were from Lowell and went to school there. An anonymous attendee asks, could I camp on any of the Brewster Islands today? Um, you can, don't tell anybody, but <laughs> no, people go out there, people kayak there and camp there. Um, I mean, technically, I, I really, it, it, you have to get out there yourself. And so I suppose that technically they may be close to camping, but, but people do camp on all the islands, whether they have permission or not. There are official camping islands, Lovell's which is closed this season, and Bumpkin and Grape, those are official camping islands, and Pedix, official camping, which is open. But I think people do go out there and camp, and certainly people have in the past uh, gone out to those islands. So if you want, if you can get out there, um, just go. I don't think anyone's going to kick you off. But there's no, we got uh, no water. You have to bring all your own water and no bathrooms. Not even like, the, there's just no bathrooms. You just have to use the bushes. You know, so it's very, it's camping, but it's a very primitive level. Uh, Diane says, what an interesting presentation. I look forward to reading the book. I'm saddened by the fact that cursive is no longer emphasized in schools. I fear so many of the younger generation may not have the opportunity to read this wonderful journal. Well, that's sweet. Well, we hope that they'll, they'll be able to read the transcript um, and perhaps even uh, look at and try to piece out. I mean, uh, one of my friends read it and then read the transcript and then tried to look at the actual handwriting. And I seem to be frozen again. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but okay. you are frozen again. <laughs> and a very expensive pose, you know. Yeah, that's okay. We're winding it down. We got a few. Okay, more that's minutes. fine. Um, we'll, just we'll we'll make this work. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what the issue is. Uh, sorry about that, Stephanie. No worries. No worries. Might be um, on my end, you know. Actually, before we proceed, let me do what I did before. So let me stop your video, and then I'm going to turn your video back on. Uh, now, give it a shot, Stephanie. Try turning your video on on your end. There we are. Okay. So okay. I guess that's that's the trick we'll use. Okay. Um, let me see here, real quick. I'm going to run through some comments, and then we have a few sure. more questions. 
Okay. Uh, Nancy says, thank you for so much for a fascinating talk and all the work you've done. I love that you've put it in context of the women's lives at that time. Osmena says, I would have loved to have been one of them. Thank you for your great work, very rewarding. Karen says, great to hear this interesting story of how women spent their time in the 1890s. I love their sense of adventure and that they recorded it. Sandra has a plug for the book she's currently reading. She's on page 75 and she says it's fantastic. She hopes to visit by boat in the future. Thank you for bringing this story to life. Uh, Wendy says, I think it would be great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wendy says she thinks it would be great to have an art exhibit of their photos and artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne says she loved it. Can't wait to read the book. Uh, Lori would like to know, and maybe you touched on this a little bit, but what is the purpose of the 15 Club? Well, that's interesting. The 15 Club actually started as the Dickens Club, and that was after a visit by Charles Dickens. It was his second visit, I think, to the United States, but Charles Dickens did visit Lowell, and he wrote about Lowell. But after his visit, the women formed the Dickens Club, and it was to read works by Dickens and discuss it. Again, this was not... This was like to be like a book club today. And then they decided to expand it because they, I think they finished 12 Dickens. And so they called it the 15 club because there are 15 members originally, but they would um, go to lectures. They traveled together, they did trips together. Um, they uh, kind of, it was kind of an extensive friendship network, but it wasn't based around families it was based around activities and some of the activities were very intellectual like they they'd go together to hear a lecture or they have uh, people would come in with books they want to discuss so it was a very it was kind of a high level uh club and there were a lot of clubs like that in in the boston area at the time in fact that's like i said there's a whole another saga of of the whole women's club movement frank says thank you fascinating reconstructed historical journal Carolyn says, excellent presentation. Thank you to you and your group for your research. Judith notes that there are yurts, Y-O-U-R-T-S. I, I feel like I know what that is. Uh, there yeah. are yurts available for camping. Uh, Margaret says from his- On Pedix Island, on Pedix Island, there's, there's, on there's Island. yeah, okay. Mar Mar Margaret says for, from a safety point of view, it's, it's best to get permission to camp on the islands. Um, Angelina says, awesome presentation. Thank you so much for this format. I will be re reading this book as part of my summer reading on the beach. Ooh, uh, we've got a few more questions, which you've addressed some of them already in the chat. Uh, Sarah asks, how did the food get delivered and who delivered it? That's a, it's a very good point. They brought a lot of food, but they seemed to have, they, there was a fisherman who lived on the island, William the, the Swede, they call him. And uh, he lived there, we're not quite sure where, but he brought the woman out there and he, he went back and forth and he would bring out milk and meat and other supplies. And uh, so they were well stocked with food. The 15 Club sent out some chalk man to get them some chocolates. Um, some yachtsmen came by and brought them lobsters and they, they boiled the lobsters on the beach. So they, they had a mixture of what they originally brought and then they had deliveries uh, bought in. Um, so that, that, was kind, that was kind of interesting that they were able to do that. It's kind of like Grubhub of the uh, Harbor Islands. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, do you see the potential for a movie based on the trip to Brewster Island? Um, well, that would be interesting. I don't, I don't know. It, I, a documentary would be fun. A documentary would be fun. I'm not sure there'd be a feature movie because, you know, there were no, there were no actual pirates there or sea monsters or anything like that. But, but um, it's um, interesting. You know, I, I'm seeing some of the comments. I want to address one thing because Carolyn writes, and seem, since most of them were of the upper classes, it's surprising they cooked and cleaned without any help. Uh, or the match. No, th that's an interesting point because John Stilgo said that indeed, these are probably women who had servants, not live-in servants, so people would help out with the cleaning and the cook, because that was really hard to do. And he said that was probably the reason why they kept track of their menus, because they were cooking for themselves. And when you're running a household, you tell the cook what to do, or you'd work with the cook. But here, they did it all themselves, and they seemed to relish it. They seem to really enjoy 
the um, the ability to do this cooking. And that was part of the reason they kept track of everything. That was his reason. And it was, again, this idea that this is not something they get to do. The servants would do that, or they'd have a cook do that. Um, but here they could do it for themselves. And there's something to that article talked about set up cooperative housekeeping. So I think they really in, enjoyed it. Uh, Margaret says a playwright friend of mine also suggested that this would make a good play. Um, um, I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. I, in fact, I, I've thought about putting together like a stage reading with uh, entries from the journal, with um, quotes from the from the poetry that they're reciting, with images of the islands in the background. So if, if your friend wants to work with uh, some sort of event like that, uh, let me know, because I, I do think it could be very theatrical. Uh, so an anonymous attendee asks, how long was their trip to the island? The, it was basically um, 17 days from July 15th to the 31st. Uh, so, uh, how, what was the size of the journal and what was the quality of the paper and binding? It was kind of held together. By, it wasn't bound. It was just some pages held together. And the size of it, I have to think about that. Um, it was about 70 pages. Total, about 70 pages. I have to go back and check on that. Um, but Great. it was pretty extensive. It was pretty exp extensive, yeah. And a uh, final question goes to Nancy, and I'm going to have a follow-up question. But okay. Nancy asks, you are quite fascinating yourself. Do you work independently and find people to research and write with you, or are you connected with an academic institution? Sorry if I missed that information. Well, generally I work by myself, although I have co-wrote, I co-wrote a book on the Boston mob with my, with my friend Beverly Ford, who's a, a, a great crime writer. This was an unusual arrangement because I, I worked with the friends. Usually I worked by myself, but I knew I could never get this work done by myself, given my obligation. So we, we coordinated it as, as a group project. And that was unusual. And, and I've actually presented on how you do that. In other words, how, how you organize volunteers. If you work for a volunteer organization, how you can, you can work together to do some sort of project using volunteers and making sure everyone gets credit and, and time. So I think that's something to look into. Um, I'm also actually this fall, I'm gonna begin teaching uh, writing at Boston University. So, um, I'm good. And the machine doesn't like me. It keeps freezes on me. So yeah, you look, you look angry at me right now. Stephanie. I am not. I'm so happy. I'm so happy about this. That's okay. but yeah, it's this. This is so I'm going to be at BU this fall. And um, oh, just a couple things. One, please um, check out the Friends of the Boston Harbor. Go to the islands. And um, I'm actually uh, writing a novel and I'm hoping that'll be out in the fall. So I'm the, the one thing I haven't done is published a novel. So I'm going to be doing right. that. Yeah, that was going to be my last question. I wanted to know what was next for you. So you, you already covered that. Okay. Uh, so uh, folks, uh, let's give Stephanie a big virtual round of applause for a great presentation. Uh, look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, information about some other upcoming virtual uh, author visits and information about our summer reading program. I again want to thank the Friends of the Library and the Corning Foundation as well as the libraries in North Reading, Dover, West Newberry, Plymouth, Danvers, Hanover, Chatham, and Maynard for partnering with Tewksbury for tonight's event. Uh, Stephanie, do you have any last words for the audience? I, I just want to say thank you so much, and um, I encourage everyone to keep your own journal, make your own record of your life, uh, because you never know, 130 years from now, somebody might want to publish it. There you go. Good note to end on. So thank you all so much, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Thanks again, Stephanie.